I say it again, Galatians 4, and chat, uh, Galatians 4 from verse 1, verses 1 to 5. Let's read together. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the holy state. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent his spirit, or the spirit of his son, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now that phrase, but when the time had fully come, tells us that God had planned the event of sending his son for a very long time. And then Jesus Christ came at the point in human history when the time was just right for the world to receive him as Saviour and Lord. But here in Galatians 1, verses 1 to 6 or 1 to 5, uh, the Apostle Paul explains the idea that people can't be saved eternally from sin by the principle of scoring brownie points with God or by any form of merit or earning or by doing good works of any kind. Salvation from sin comes by God's sovereign grace through the working of the principle of trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now Paul explains this in a remarkable way here. He uses the analogy of a child becoming an adult. He compares the privileges of a child to the privileges of a servant or a slave, really, here in the text. And and, and with the figures of a child and a servant representing life under the law, life before salvation, and the figure of an adult son representing the new life in Jesus Christ, life after someone is saved, you see. And this includes both Jews and Gentiles. Now why does he do this? Because God's purpose with the law, and we're thinking here really of the the moral law, but also the other commandments, the Ten Commandments mostly, was to prepare both Jew and Gentile for the glorious privilege of becoming eternal sons and daughters of God through faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how does that work? Well, I thought about this and I asked Rachel last night, but Rachel, my daughter, welcome also, Rachel. I asked her a question, and I'm asking you the same question. What happens when you eat salty food? Especially Christmas time, you sit in front of the TV, you sit somewhere, and and you're stuffing your face with chips and other salty things, peanuts and so on, and it's nice and tasty, but what happens to you? What is the result of that? You get thirsty. You get very thirsty, indeed. And obviously, uh, movie uh, houses and movie syndicates uh, understood this principle very early in in, in the movie industry history because they started serving up popcorn in movie theatres, salty popcorn. People love that people eat when they watch movies, but the result was that they needed something more so that they would spend more money, not just, not just on popcorn, but on drinks and all kinds of other things in those movie theatres. But this is the principle. When you eat salt, you get thirsty. In the same way, the law of God 
was and still is like a very salty food that makes us thirsty for the first quenching living water of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if you look at the Ten Commandments and you look at them seriously, just go and read them, Exodus chapter 20 one day, and apply them to your own life, you'll soon start realizing that you fall short at every point and that you are guilty before God who gave those commandments and, who are, and they are really an expression of his holy character and that you need somebody to save you from your guilt. Well, in the same way, what we find here is that the law prepared people for the living water of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is what verses 1 to 3 tells us. Look there. It's a preparation for sonship in God's family. Preparation to become part of God's family. Look, look at what he says. What I'm saying is this, that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the Holy Saint. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. Now, in the ancient world, it wasn't quite like today, especially when it came to children and young people and so on. Uh, there was a greater distinction between childhood and adulthood. It was a lot more definite than in most of our cultures today. Uh, and although ancient customs varied in this regard, there was usually a prescribed age when a child, especially a boy, would officially come of age and take on the privileges and responsibilities of adulthood. You could think of the, the Jewish culture, the Jewish boy's bar mitzvah. That's what they called it. They still call it that today. Uh, when the boy is 12 years old, uh, the father hands over the responsibility for his son uh, to God, and the son commits himself to God to serve him from that day on. In the Greek culture, uh, we had the same thing. Just a bit older, about 18 years of age, you would have a festival called the Apaturia, and at that time, uh, young men at that age would be selected and they would be called ephibos, meaning that they were like cadets, military cadets for two years, uh, preparing them for service in society and obviously in the military as well, 18 years of age. And then they would be regarded as adults. Roman culture had a similar at, at, at similar uh, 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 rituals that they went through, boys had to give up their toys at a certain age. Girls had to give up their dolls at a certain age. Those toys were burnt as an offering to the, to the god of Apollos, uh, signifying childhood was over and adulthood was upon them. Now, thankfully, we don't have those things today anymore. Hey, boys and girls, your toys, horrible. to think that your toys will be taken away from you. But that was the way people did at that time. A child took on the responsibilities and privileges of adulthood at the time of his coming of age, but never before that time. So when Paul wrote here in verse 1 about being a child, people would have understood that as long as their child or their heir was a child, he was, for all practical purposes, no different to a slave. Two, a son and heir, of his father's estate, the boy was the potential and rightful owner of everything, true, 
But as William Hendrickson explains it, he says, he was only an heir de jure and not an heir de facto. He was heir by legal right, but not heir in fact. And in those days, family would assign capable slaves to act as guardians and teachers to care for the child until he was grown up. And those family slaves oversaw the child's education and training and welfare. So the child was subservient to the slaves. And for all practical purposes, the child was no different to the slaves who took care of him. But at the time set by the father, the child's status changed radically. He was no longer simply an heir de jure, but he became an heir de facto. He was no longer a child or like a slave, but a responsible adult citizen and the actual heir of his father's estate. Now, in the same way, Paul now says here in verse 3, so also when we were children, talking to Christians, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. What does he mean by that? Simply that for an unbeliever, there is always the potential of salvation. But unless the person spiritually comes of age through saving trust in Jesus Christ, every unbeliever stays a slave, imprisoned under the basic principles of the world. And by the basic principles or rudimentary principles or the elemental things, the a, we mean the ABCs of human religion. Like the Jewish religion during the New Testament times was controlled by a system of rabbinic traditions that stifled the revealed truth of the Old Testament. And in the Gentile world of that day, human philosophy and pagan religions were closely interrelated. And both Jewish traditions and pagan religions centered in man-made systems of works. They were filled with rules and regulations and rituals and people thought that by obeying them or by going through them that that would make them right before the gods or with God. But the problem is that this is and was religious slavery. And worse, all this effort was useless and for nothing. It could not please God even in the slightest. Why not? Because without saving faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it is impossible to please God. Whatever we do, no matter how impressive it may be, it is never good enough for us fallen creatures to earn salvation from the thrice holy, perfect, omnipotent, omniscient God who created all things. We all fall short of the glory of God. The only way we can be saved is through a God-given faith and trust in Jesus Christ, our sin-bearer and our saviour. If you come from a Methodist background, this story will probably resonate very well with you, but also with the rest of us. John Wesley was an honest graduate of the Oxford University and an ordained clergyman in the Church of England and orthodox in theology. He was active in practical good works, regularly visiting the inmates of prisons and workhouses in London and helping to distribute food and clothing to slum children and orphans. He studied the Bible diligently and attended numerous Sunday services as well as various other services during the week. He generously gave offerings to the church and alms to the poor. 
He prayed and fasted and lived an exemplary moral life. He even spent several years as a missionary to the American Indians in what was then the British colony of Georgia. Yet when he returned to England, he confessed in his journal, I went to America to convert others, but I was never myself converted to God. And later, reflecting on his pre-conversion condition, he said, I had even then the faith of a servant and not that of a son. And Messi was commendable. I mean, the stuff he did was amazing. But it was useless in terms of earning salvation with God. Wesley tirelessly did everything he could to live a life acceptable to God. Yet he knew something vital was missing. And it was not until he went very unwillingly to a society meeting in Aldersgate Street in London one evening that he discovered true Christianity. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed, he wrote. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. From then on, things were no longer basic and elemental for Wesley. He had come of age and entered the heavenlies. That's the difference here, you see. Verses 4 and 5. That is the preparation for sonship. The source of our sonship. The source. Where Where do our sonship come from? How do we become children of God? Watch. Watch the word of God. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. The source of divine sonship is the true son, Jesus Christ. And just like a human father in ancient times set the time for his son's coming of age, so that God the Father set the time to send his eternal son to earth as our Redeemer. And it was in the fullness of time that Jesus came, meaning exactly how and when the Father had planned it. And when God sent his son, he provided us, I tell you, with a guarantee that all true believers would become joint heirs with the son of eternal life. Yes, people who are still under the law are no better off than slaves. But those who trust in Christ receive full and complete adoption as sons. Think about this for a moment. When Jesus was born, everything was ready for the coming of Messiah. The time was right, religiously. Remember the Jewish people during the Babylonian captivity uh, finally forsook their idolatry that they so often fell into in the Old Testament times. And despite their many other sins and failures, including the national rejection of their own Messiah, the Jews never returned to idolatry after that, introducing monotheism into the world. Also during the exile in Babylon, the Jews developed synagogues. They used as places of worship and as schools and as courts. And in addition to that, at last they had the completed Old Testament compiled by Ezra, in their hands after they returned from Babylon. 
So you can see that all this helped to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the people of Israel and further afield. Because when the Apostle Paul went around in the ancient world, where did he go to first? He went to the synagogue and started preaching the gospel there, you see. Yes. Secondly, the time was right culturally. At the time, there was one language most people understood and spoke. And what language was that? Hebrew? Latin? <laughs> what other languages were there? The language was Greek. That made it so much easier for the gospel to be preached in the Roman Empire. Alexander the Great had thoroughly established Greek culture and language throughout the known world. And this continued long after Rome succeeded Greece as the world leader. Thirdly, the time was right politically. Rome had instituted the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. That provided economic and political stability in the world. And the apostles and other early preachers could travel freely throughout the empire. And they could do so on the magnificent system of roads built by the Romans. So all these factors helped to spread the gospel. God's timing was perfect here, you see. In fact, he prepared the world. And when God's time of favor came, he sent his eternally unique son to be born of a woman, to be born under law, to redeem those under law that he might receive or that they might receive the full rights of sons. Anybody falling asleep? I see a few smiles. Is it a bit warm? Are you hot? I'm getting hot under the collar here, but, well, that's to be expected. Remember who the son is. Who is this baby that we're singing about? I've been singing about this morning. Well, he is fully and eternally God and co-equal with the Father and the Spirit eternally. Yet he came and willingly submitted himself to the Father by taking a lowly human nature upon himself. And he did it just like an obedient son would to his earthly father. Astounding to think that Jesus did that so that we may be saved. Hey? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Then the Word Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, became flesh, a human being, and made his dwelling among us. He put up his tabernacle among us. He tabernacled among us. He put his tent up in our midst. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He was fully and completely human as well. He was born of a woman just like all other people. Yet he was fully God. A miracle. We can't explain that with our little pea brains. Magnificent. And if that had not been so, he would not have been the saviour of the world. He had to be fully God for his sacrifice to have the necessary worth to atone for the sin of sinful people, and he had to be fully human to be able to represent us humans before the Father and to take the penalty of our sin upon himself on our behalf. And like every other person, Jesus was born under the law, like every Jew and every Gentile. He was under obligation to obey and be judged by conformity 
to God's written law in the Old Testament. But unlike any other Jew or Gentile, he satisfied the requirements of that law by living in perfect obedience to it. Because he lived in perfect obedience, he was able to save and redeem people who were under the law but not obedient to it, provided they had saving faith in him. And so they receive their full right of sonship. Think about this. Think about the privilege here. To be fully received into God's family. Not just any old family, not an earthly family, not a royal family, not an important family, but God's family. To have God as your father, Jesus as your savior and brother and friend, and the Holy Spirit as your helper and comforter and treasure and assurance. Think about that. Trusting in Jesus Christ brings you those things. He takes you right into the presence of the Almighty. In fact, the Bible says he makes you a co-heir of eternal life with himself. The alternative? Eternal slavery. Consider this. Seriously for yourself. Come to Christ. Trust in Christ. Put your trust in Him. And the doors of heaven, they are open already. You will be able to enter into the full forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Yes, we stole here on earth and we, we struggle and we suffer and we fight because the flesh is weak and all those things. But we have this assurance. Once we trust in Christ, we have heaven and we are safe. But now for the cherry on top of the Christmas cake. Hey, you like cake? Who likes cake? The prince likes cake. Oh, yes, there's someone. Yes, we like cake. Now for the cherry on top of the Christmas cake. And the star right on top of the Christmas tree. You know that star we put on? Sometimes we put an angel on, but a star right on top of the Christmas tree. Here it comes. Verse 6. The confirmation of our sonship. The assurance. Look there. Because you are sons, that is if you trust in Christ, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out. Abba, Father. God confirms that we are his adopted children through the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of his Son. And we don't know only mentally, through the Bible obviously, but mentally that we belong to the Lord. We have a deep assurance that we are his through the indwelling Spirit in our hearts. What is impossible for people to do, God does by sending his Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts as believers. Wow, what a privilege. When we experience difficult circumstances or when we fail and we don't obey the Lord, it's so easy for Christians to become fearful or to have doubts about who we really belong to. Isn't that so? We question ourselves. We sometimes forget about our exalted position as the Lord's children. And we run after the world and we want the blessings from the world because we think, they, the world, yes. There, if I achieve something, that is something amazing. But the most amazing thing is that we become God's children through faith in Christ. And we are highly favored 
in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are so forever. We sometimes forget about our exalted position as the Lord's children. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to cry out to him with full confidence, Abba Father. Dear Father in heaven, dear heavenly daddy, daddy. Paul wrote like this in Romans 8, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Dad, Father. And the Spirit itself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Go and read it for yourself. Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. The Holy Spirit brings us into an intimate, personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. And when we approach Him, and we, I tell you, we can approach Him at any time, under any circumstances, not just in prayer meetings, not just when the pastor comes, you can approach him at any time, in any circumstance. And he always hears us and lovingly cares for us. If you have this intimate communion with your Heavenly Father, it is a beautiful, magnificent assurance that you belong to the Lord and that nothing will ever separate you from his love.